Amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn to John 4. We're going to get right into it this week. We are in our sermon series in the Gospel of John. It has been an amazing journey, and so I hope you are tracking along with us in this series. This morning, we're going to be in John chapter 4. We're going to be on the back end of this story that's probably familiar to many of us, Jesus meeting the woman at the well. Last week, Rob beautifully spoke to us out of the first part of that. I'm going to wrap this episode up. And so I love how this ends in John 4, verse 26. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Now, Rob covered this verse, but I want to start here because I love this transition moment that Jesus reveals his identity to a woman who doesn't have a name. And isn't this beautiful about the character of God, that God will venture to a place you're not supposed to go, to talk to a person you're not supposed to speak with, to reveal something that has yet to be revealed to anyone else. That a woman of no name is the first to hear Jesus reveal his true name. I am is speaking with you. And it's here at this moment of this, of this powerful revelation. And here's the revelation, by the way, and I love this because we, we have this purpose statement at Grace Midtown, together inviting all humans to become awake to God. And isn't this so fitting for us that, that Jesus will cross this boundary to reveal his identity, his name, for the purpose that all humans might become awake, that this woman would have the opportunity to become awake to God. And that's what we're beginning here to see in a clearer focus, and it will become more and more clear as we journey through the Gospel of John of who Jesus is revealed through the character of Jesus by way of his interaction with people. It's so important that we just don't pay attention to what Jesus is saying, but we pay attention to the story in which he's saying it. And so here we are, verse 27, and we're gonna try to get to the end of this episode. We're gonna, we're gonna visit it in sections. The hope is to go verse by verse. That's not gonna happen, but hopefully section by section, and we'll pull some, some things out that will be helpful for us. So verse 27, just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. And so we just have this amazing, beautiful, powerful revelation and the disciples return from being in the city to buy dinner, and perhaps in the most not emotionally aware or intelligent manner, they interrupt this interaction. And they're astonished. Now here's the thing with this word astonished that John is using here. John generally uses this word in relation to miracles and revelatory teaching. So already John is wanting us, the reader, to begin to pay attention and to focus in on this interaction that Jesus is having with this woman on par with revelatory teaching and miraculous action. The disciples are astonished. And they're astonished because as Rob spoke of Last week, first we see Jesus crossing this ethnic boundary of a Jewish man interacting with a Samaritan. Here, in a more personal way, John begins to hone in on a man interacting with a woman. 
And the disciples are astonished. They're astonished. Because culturally, this would be scandalous. This wouldn't be something that men generally do in this culture, is speak publicly with women, especially alone. And it certainly isn't someone at least known as a rabbi would do. That a rabbi would not be caught publicly speaking to women. So we're already, we're beginning to see the tension here of Jesus crossing another socially constructed boundary. And it's an important one. And let me say this about the woman, because we often highlight Jesus crossing a boundary here, but the woman shows an amazing bravery and vulnerability in this interaction, because she crosses the boundary too. It takes both of them to have this interaction. She is brave, and we don't have to work hard to imagine what this might do to her reputation in this culture, because throughout the centuries, we've already projected all kinds of things on her life that the text actually doesn't, which when we hold that up as a mirror tells us more about how we judge people than how Jesus or the author of this text, John, judges people. And so Jesus is crossing this boundary, and the disciples are astonished. Now, here's the other thing about astonishment. I think we can often read that word astonished and think scandal. Well, you know, you can be astonished and it not be scandalous. You can be astonished and it be in line with the character of the person. What do I mean by this? I think about the first time my kids took a step and began to walk. I was astonished that they were taking one step, two steps, three steps, falling into my arms. But it wasn't a scandal. I wasn't shocked. I didn't need to rebuke them. It's in line with their character to learn to walk. If Joseph Martinez scores a hat trick, scores three goals in a game, I'll be astonished. But it will be in line with the character of his play. And that's what's happening here with the disciples. They are astonished with something that actually is within the character of Jesus. Let me show you. Because the text says this. But no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Here's what, here's what John is doing by asking those two questions. This is a Middle Eastern cultural thing. If they were to ask those questions publicly, it would be to show they distrust their rabbi and that they're scandalized by his actions. Because they do not ask those questions, what John subversively is highlighting to us here is that they fully trust their rabbi, their teacher, Jesus, and that this is not unusual, if even, even astonishing behavior. In fact, many commentators would say, and you'll see this throughout the Gospel of John, the way he elevates the place of women in the ministry of Jesus, that what John is doing here is even a step further in highlighting that women traveled with and were disciples of Jesus. Isn't that good news? Isn't that good news? That the discipleship of Jesus is not limited by gender barriers that women are invited to the inner place of Jesus, that women are integral to the ministry of Jesus, that it's a woman who hears this revelation of the identity of who Jesus is. And we'll see more of how she responds to that as we move on. And so we see this idea with these questions, this cultural idea that it wouldn't be scandalous but I also want to approach these questions a second way. 
Because when we read the text, it's important for us to know the historical and cultural setting within which things are placed. And may I submit that there's more to the text than just its historical and cultural setting. And I would, I would submit to us that when we read the Gospels, paying attention to the questions really matters. And adopting those questions as spiritual practice in our own life is really helpful. And so we see these two questions, what do you want and why are you speaking to her? Well, both questions here, they're really good questions to ask Jesus. Don't you think in your prayer life? Jesus, what do you want in our prayer life? Jesus, why are you up to that? See, these are living questions. They're interactive questions. They're they're relationship questions. They're, They're God and I are communicating questions. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? And Jesus is about to, even though these questions aren't asked publicly, he's actually about to answer them with the disciples, contextual to this episode. And throughout the book of John, he's actually going to answer these questions in very sort of ultimate kind of ways, especially when we get to the high priestly prayer recorded in John 17. And so I would be paying attention through the rest of the gospel. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Important questions John is offering us here. Let's move on. John 4, 28 to 30. Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on the way to him. So I love this. The first image here. This woman is having this amazing and beautiful interaction with Jesus. The disciples interrupt it. And now John leaves us this amazing detail. It's sort of like a, an Oprah book club kind of detail. If you ever watched one of these Oprah book club shows, they get a whole bunch of people around a table and they start talking about a book. And before you know it, you're like, what does this even have to do with the plot of the book? They're talking about the painting that hangs in the living room of the main character throughout the whole story, and what does it symbolize? What does it mean? What's the the depth of this for us in our story? How are we relating to it? By the way, John's very literary. He's doing the same thing here. John uses images to convey the depth of meaning of Christ to us. Why? So often we want the Bible to be axioms that are tweetable, We want it to be propositional truth that we can digest and obey. We want it to be checklists of to-dos and don'ts. The problem is those things don't carry the depth and the riches of Christ in the way that images do. They don't cross boundaries in the way that images do. They don't hold themselves in timeless ways the way images do. So John, as we're reading and journeying through this, wants us to pay attention to the image. And here the image is that she's left her jar. And we can skip past it or we can see the depth of meaning to this. Because remember, Jesus didn't have a jar and he's asking for a drink. And now as the disciples interrupt, she is leaving to go back into town after encountering Jesus and leaving her jar. I think there's probably at least four ways that we can explore this idea of her leaving the jar. The first would just be good old-fashioned hospitality, which we could talk about the Middle Eastern expectations and demands of hospitality. Certainly, that would have something to do with it. I think it's very compassionate. Jesus was thirsty and needed a drink and didn't have a vessel, and she left the jar for him to get a drink. But there's deeper meaning here. I think it sends to us the signal that this woman has begun to understand what Jesus is talking about when he says, if you take a drink of the waters that I have, you'll never thirst again. That it's a symbol to say she is leaving her old life and her old ways down. 
And she has taken up a drink of the eternal and living waters that Christ has offered. That she's taking a drink. She's beginning to believe. I love it. It's that moment in the Matrix, if you've ever seen the Matrix, where Neo's fighting some people and they're like, what's happening? And Morpheus is like, he's beginning to believe. And that's what this is. It's, it's this woman in her journey. She's beginning to believe that Jesus is who he says he is and provides what he says he provides. And so she lays down her jar. She lays her vessel down. And we're in Lent. What are the vessels that have brought us satisfaction? What are the vessels that have even brought others satisfaction? that God might be inviting us to lay down and leave behind, that we would pick up the better, that we would pick up the eternal waters, the water that never runs dry. There's nothing wrong with drinking water. We need it to survive. But there's something better and deeper and more fulfilling and satisfying than this water. And it's the living water that Jesus offers. What are the lesser satisfactions that we can leave behind to pick up what Jesus is giving? Another way to think about this. When we move on in this verse, Jesus is about to say something really fun. He's about to talk about food, and he's about to say, I have bread that you don't know about and that my bread is to do the will of God. I would submit to you that what John wants us to get a picture of here is that this woman has water that we don't know about, and she's laying her jar down because she's picking up the will of God. She's about to be the work of the work of the Father. She's entering into the sowing and the reaping. She's entering into the harvest that God is promising. Lastly, and we're going to see this progression throughout John. In John 2, Jesus turns water to wine, right? The vessels are filled. The waters of purification become the new wine, the better wine. It's an eschatological fulfillment. And not only fulfillment, but it's the picture that it's better than we could have ever imagined. Because Jesus fulfills everything better than we could have imagined. Here what we see is the vessel is left behind because the woman becomes the vessel of living water. That when you and I drink of the living waters of Jesus, we become a source of living water. We become a vessel to offer this drink to others. We become a vessel who offers life to the people around us, to our families and friends and coworkers and neighbors and enemies that a drink from the waters of Jesus doesn't merely satisfy you, but it transforms you. It changes you. You become the source. So the axiom for us here is to take a drink and become the vessel. Take a drink and become the vessel. Let's drink deeply of the waters of Jesus. Let's spend time with Jesus at the well of our life and allow him to transform our lives into sources of life for others. Because it's never just for us. It's always for the world around us. It's for us and the world around us. So take a drink, become the vessel. It says here in the text that the woman went back to the city. Important to note this, that she becomes the first woman evangelist. Apparently she didn't get the memo or read the books that said women can't preach. She didn't. And dare I say more than evangelist. Because we'd use the word apostolic right here if we were talking about men. 
because she takes the revelation of Jesus as the Messiah to a people who have never heard the revelation of Jesus as a Messiah. That's apostolic work. That's Pauline Apostle, capital A, Apostle work. I know, we want axioms. Jesus is cool with women preaching. Jesus gives you the story right here. And this is important. I love it. We need women to preach and to do ministry and to lead. We just do. I know there's a lot of stuff out there that says otherwise. They're wrong. The Bible says it. I don't, hey, all right. But she goes back to the city, and I love this, because not only does Jesus transform us into a vessel of living water, but we're so transformed that we can go back into the places from where we came, and people receive and notice the change and transformation in our life. And how many of you know, like if you've li- like I've lived in Atlanta for eight years now, When I go home, so often people just hold you to who you were back then, the last time they saw you. Don't they, like, have you ever experienced that? I mean, people just think you don't grow or change or mature or actually, like, repent of stuff. And so they they hold you to these old life markers, these old ways of identifying you and even ways you've identified yourself. But I love that the boldness that this woman has, and it's so vulnerable Because I don't know about you, like the scariest place to go after you've encountered Jesus and have changed is like with people who would most know what was changed. Like you can tell all your friends about Jesus that don't really know you. It's really hard to go back to your old friends that know all the stuff. Like how vulnerable is this? She's so brave, she's so vulnerable. And she's been wrecked by Jesus. And she goes back to her people. And she says, come and see. I love this, together inviting. It's an invitation, come and see. So many of us want to argue about our faith and prove our faith and fight with people about our faith. And I promise you, it's not really very helpful. But she gives us such a beautiful, humble, vulnerable, and yet bravely powerful model to follow. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. Do we live a come and see life? He told me everything. I believe this is because her sense of self, like so many of us, is locked up in the actions of her story and of her past. And what we're seeing through her drinking this living water that Jesus has to offer is that stuff changes and is healed and she's set free of some stuff. And we can assume what that is. I think it'd be best not to assume. But nonetheless, to encounter Jesus is to be changed and to be transformed to where Jesus can tell you about your life and your story and your questions and your doubts and your fears and all the things that have happened to you and all the things that have happened because of choices you've made. But it becomes a beautiful story that somehow we can share with others that's a source of life rather than a source of shame and guilt and condemnation that we wear upon ourselves. And this is the beautiful way of Jesus. And then she says, he can't be the Messiah, can he? This is amazing. Here's what's happening. Can I show you what's happening here? When she first encounters Jesus, he's a man. Then he's a Jewish man. Then he's a prophet. Now she's asking if he's the Messiah. Spoiler spoiler alert, this episode's about to end with he's the savior of the world. This is her progressive revelation and journey of faith. This is her wrestling with this encounter with Jesus and coming to faith. 
And it's beautiful. It's amazing. I love it. And her view of Jesus seems to coincide with her view of, it, of herself, doesn't it? That the more bold she becomes in who Jesus is, the more bold she becomes in that she leaves her vessel behind and goes back to her people. And that as she goes back to her people and shares what she's wrestling with, ultimately they all come to Jesus as the savior of the world. What a beautiful circle of faith. That the more she knows who God is, the more she knows who she is. And the more she knows who she is, the more she comes to understand who God is. There's something else I want us to pick up on here. Jesus is never offended or rebukes her for whatever stage of faith she's in in this conversation. Maybe you've heard Jesus say it this way, a bruised reed I will not break. He's only ever respectful of where she is in her journey. He's only ever tender with where she is in her journey. And I don't know about you, but I've heard a lot of things said about faith, people's faith journey over the last two or three years, especially. And so much of it is like, hey, you know, there's a healthy way to be in your process. But I think it's missing the point. Because the point with Jesus seems to be this. There's a healthy way to make room for people who are in their process. There's a way not to bruise, not, not to break a bruised reed. There's a way not to be offended in our faith by someone else's journey. There's a way for us to not be shaken because someone else is in doubt. There's a way for us to not panic because they don't know if Jesus is a Jewish man or a Messiah or the Savior of the world. But as we make space and hold space for them to wrestle, we see that process happen. Jesus will reveal himself because that's what Jesus wants to do. John 4, 31 to 34. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who has sent me and to complete his work. And so here we are. I'm going to skip some things. Here we are, again, coming back to those questions. Why are you speaking with her? What do you want? It's in part answered in this, to do the will of him who sent me. And that God's will here is to be about the business of God's kingdom, not, not just like eating food and drink, not just like the normal stuff of life, not even just like the necessary things of life, but like, what is God up to in the field of our life? And in a little bit, and in some ways, this throws back right to the, to the temptation in the desert, doesn't it? That man won't live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That Jesus is taking something normal and daily and wanting to point us and direct us to a spiritual truth. In the Pauline canon, Paul writes it this way, life is more than food and drink. It's righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Like there's more to life than the normal stuff of life. There's righteousness, there's right relating to God and to others. There's real joy and there's real peace when we rightly relate to God and to others. And we see that this is the bread of the will of God that Jesus is fulfilling in this episode. He's rightly relating with God by crossing a boundary so that he can rightly relate with a person who is believed to be out of the boundaries of God's will. He's setting right relationship that we can move beyond food and drink and enter into the joy and peace of God's kingdom. John 35 to 38. Do you not say four months more than comes harvest? But I tell you, look around and see fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so the sower and reaper may rejoice together. 
For here the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. This is, this is probably a proverb when he says four months more, which is, which is that we wouldn't know, but, it's, but most scholars believe he's quoting a proverb that would have been well known. That's basically just reminding people like there's a time to be diligent and work hard in sowing because there's a season of reaping that's coming. But then Jesus flips this proverb on his head by saying, the time of waiting is gone. It's actually time to sow and reap all at the same time. The fulfillment of the promises of God are here and now. So open your eyes. Can you see what I see? Because most of us are like the disciples. We're going into town to buy groceries without ever asking the question, God, what might you be up to? No, I'm so serious. This is my life. My head is down and I'm doing my stuff. And as I was reading this text, I was reminded I have these friends in my life and they're beautiful and annoying all at the same time. Like every time you go to get coffee with them, this is what I know is gonna happen. I'm like praying there's not a line. Because they're gonna, we're gonna get in line and they're gonna be like, hey dude, what do you think God's saying to that person? I'm like, I don't know, I was hoping to just get a cookie. and a coffee. You're like, man, I don't know. I think God's telling me like A, B, and C are happening in their life and they have some pain in their body and I think God wants to heal them right now. I'm like, really? I was trying to find out if I wanted like a medium or a large. Or I'm at the grocery store with them. You know, they're like, hey, I gotta go pick up some dessert for house church. Come with me. And you're like, oh man, this is not just dessert. Because the same thing. They're gonna be asking the question the whole way there. It's like gonna be worship music and prayer the whole way there. God, what are you doing at the grocery store? Who are you loving? Who are you healing? Who are you speaking to? And then we get there and, and God is really speaking to people. In the checkout line, in the aisles, people are really getting healed. Destiny is really being changed because God has shared something with another person about their life. It's really happening. I could tell you countless stories of the amounts of times that I've been at a coffee shop or a grocery store or just going for a walk with certain friends of mine and it's like God interrupts it every time if we simply open our eyes to see the harvest that's white. But most of us are about the normal stuff of life, never asking what God might be up to. I know I am and I was so convicted by this and I know in my own life, the pendulum has swung so hard. I'm like, well, you know, the sacrament of the present moment, it's all holy. And it is. And I know I am so unaware of what's going on around me most of the time. And so unaware of what God is doing around me most of the time. And that God wants to speak to people and intercept their life because there's something powerful and meaningful for them in that moment. Amen? So we've got to keep our eyes open. Why? Because the kingdom is here now. Now is the time. Jesus wants to reveal himself to people. Finally, in the last section of this verse, many Samaritans believed because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. So here we go. One, often we wake up to God because others who are awake to God share their story with us. And by the way, this is generally how God has made himself vulnerable to human beings. This is the weak way God has decided to mostly make himself known in the world through you and I, sharing our testimony and living a life of witness. And what do I mean by being a witness? Living a life that is faithful to the way of Jesus. And all I mean by testimony is sharing our story of what God has done for us. That's it. But this is how God has decided to wake up the world. And then here's this thing, though. Because they believe because of her testimony, but then it says they hear for themselves. 
And I was thinking about I grew up with Christian parents, and so I was able to come and see the beauty of Jesus often. But it was when I asked Jesus to stay and abide that I heard for myself and really came into my own faith. And so here's the invitation, is not to simply depend on the testimony and witness of others, but to ask Jesus to stay in our lives that we'd hear for ourselves and have our own testimony and witness. In fact, so much of the harm that comes in our faith life is because we depend on the witness and testimony of others or because they demand a dependence upon their testimony and witness. But like John the Baptist who says, I must decrease so he can increase, so too this woman's testimony must decrease so the revelation of Christ may increase. That people would hear for themselves, and that's the invitation for us, is to hear for ourselves. The band can come. And so we have to, we have to move beyond the testimony of others to grow and mature in our own faith. And at the end of this, it says they've come to decide and to know that Jesus is the savior of the world. And what's going on here in the language is that Jesus is revealed as the ruler who sets all things right. Who sets all things right. And so the question for us is, are we willing to ask Jesus to stay with us? to abide, and again, this is gonna be a theme throughout John. Will Jesus remain with us? Will he stay with us? Will he abide with us? That we might receive the drink that Jesus has, the waters of eternal life. That we might allow him to set everything in our life right. That our hearts would be awakened and we would be astonished by the beauty of Jesus. Are we astonished by the one who would go to the well in pursuit of us to reveal that the I am speaks to you? Are we willing to be astonished by the one who crosses boundaries, speaks to those whom should not be spoken to culturally and reveals who he is? Let's stand. Jesus, stay with us. Remain with us. Abide with us that we might see you and what you see, that we might receive the drink that you have for us and become a vessel of living water, that we might be astonished that you, the savior of the world, desire each and every one of us. Amen.